So our first presenter is Joanna Santala from uh, the, the Finnish Food Authority. So she's the head of the plant, uh, plant pest and grain section in plant analytic units. Uh, she's a virologist by training. And um, although the lab is mostly dealing with daily sampling samples, they are currently working with HDS in different research projects. So please, Joanna. And Joanna is also a member of the panel on diagnostic and quality assurance. And she's been involved in the preparation of the HDS standard. So. So, uh, good morning. My name is Johanna Sandalas, as uh, Sandra already introduced me, and uh, thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, I was asked to present a kind of basic uh, or general presentation of, uh, of HDS as a technology. So, uh, uh, of course, HDS is a lot of things. So, if your favorite application or favorite platform is not mentioned during this presentation. I'm sorry, but uh, anything, everything could not be fit in. And everything that I tell is only, only an example. So there are many more things that you can do with it. So first, uh, some terms. So at least in my institute, people use these different uh, names of the different platforms and names of the different techniques and and different uh, terms like uh, as a synonyms, even though they are not really really the same thing. So basically, people talk about high throughput sequencing, which is uh, the same as next generation sequencing, which is uh, kind of maybe an old term for for HDS. And this is also the same as deep sequencing. Then there are different platforms that you can use to do, do HDS. For example, Illumina dye sequencing. Then there is, for example, BacBio single molecule, molecule real-time sequencing, ion torrent, Oxford nanopore solid. And at least in my, my laboratory paper, People sometimes just talk about Illumina sequencing when they actually mean the whole HDS, for example. And then there are different uh, uh, techniques. So there is uh, amplicon sequencing, also called uh, like uh, metapar coding. Then there is uh, dot com sequencing, uh, for example, whole genome sequencing or, or small uh, RNA sequencing. And, also in my institute, many people just use whole genome sequencing for the technique. So when they actually talk about HDS as a whole. So just to kind of go through these different words that you might have heard. So then what is HDS? So uh, most laboratories use Sanger sequencing. And uh, Sanger sequencing is always targeted, so you somehow target the area that you are you want to sequence. And uh, these uh, nucleic acids that you have are prepared for sequencing by a PCR reaction that basically produces <coughs> different lengths of your target molecule with labeled uh, nucleotides at the end. And then in the sequencer, you kind of separate the different length molecules by size, and uh, the sequencer reads the labeled nucleotides at the end of the each, uh, each uh, molecule. And you end up with one consensus sequence. So what you get out of your sample is kind of the overall uh, sequence that, uh, that is uh, uh, that presents the, all the actually all the different molecules that you actually have in your sample. So compared to HDS, which is it might be targeted, but it also might be more or less non-targeted sequencing. And uh, in HDS, you prepare the, your molecules to sequencing. Uh, it depends on the platform you are you are using and on the 
uh, on the chemistry that you are using, but uh, the main thing is that you somehow prepare your uh, molecules for sequencing to make them correct size and to make them suitable for your platform. And then on the actual sequencer, the uh, nucleic acids are, uh, are detected. Uh, I will show briefly some examples later, but they are uh, uh, sequenced separately. So each, uh, each molecule that you have, basically each molecule that you have in the sample is sequenced separately and you end up with uh, several individual sequences. Uh, so the difference to Sanger sequencing is that uh, you can actually see the variation in your uh, in the sequences of your molecules that you have in the sample. So in Sanger sequencing, like you see in this uh, diagram, you can have some indication that there might be different <coughs> nucleotides at, at certain points of your sequence when you end up with this kind of a, uh, uncertain nucleotide. But with HDS, you actually get, uh, get uh, each individual sequence separately. So you know exactly that in one of your molecules, you might have A at the position where there is the green A, but in one, you might have T, for example. Ah, good. Yeah, so uh, you can actually see what kind of variation you have in your sequences. So the HDS procedure starts uh, it actually starts with sampling. I have it in parentheses, not because sampling would not be important, but because uh, sampling is well, normally not done by the laboratory. But of course, laboratories keep guidance on, on sampling. And it's, of course, important also for HDS tests to do the sampling properly. But what actually happens usually first in the laboratory is the uh, nucleic acid extraction. So um, in the laboratory, you, you might have different kinds of matrices that you, you want to use HDS on. So you might have a matrix with uh, it's a multiple organisms, such as plant tissue that might contain several different microorganisms. You might have environmental samples or spore traps or all kinds of different different samples. Uh, then you might also have isolated organisms, so uh, microbial colonies on artificial media that you want to start your HDS process on. Uh, or then you might have uh, amplified PCR products, for example. Um, and what you can extract from these different kinds of samples that you have in your laboratory. You can decide to ex extract uh, genomic DNA or RNA or a total DNA or RNA, or you might need for your application only the small RNAs or double-stranded RNAs. So it depends what you want to do with your, with your sample. <coughs> But uh, then one of the uh, uh, one of the or the next step for the high throughput sequencing is that when you have your nucleic acids, no matter what what they are, here they are, for example, genomic DNA or RNA, you have to somehow make them suitable for your sequencing platform. So here are some examples what you might might have to do with your uh, starting nucleic acids. So, for example, you might go for more targeted uh, high throughput sequencing and uh, do some uh, RT PCR or with DNA PCR to have <laughs> amplicons that you want to uh, uh, want to sequence. Or then you might have genomic DNA and you need to somehow uh, slice it to make it suitable size for your platform. So here is an example where you would use uh, uh, enzymes to cut, cut the DNA in 
uh, correct size pieces, or then you might uh, uh, somehow uh, um, convert, oh, do this reverse uh, transcription on your RNA and uh, and turn it into DNA and add some uh, add some uh, adapters to make your RNA suitable for your platform. But uh, and also, it's uh, possible to directly sequence RNA. But anyway, whatever you do, you end up with so-called library molecules that have uh, at least some kind of uh, adapters that uh, help you to link the, your molecules to your platform so that they, uh, they are suitable for sequencing. And then you might also add some uh, indexes, so normally in high or many times in high throughput sequencing, you want to com uh, combine many samples in one sequencing run because you get a lot of data and it's also a little bit expensive. So you might want to get uh, more samples in one sequencing run. So then you also have to add some kind of uh, indexes to uh, to be able to after the sequencing to separate the uh, the reads coming from different samples. So then we come to the actual sequencing. So uh, this this step uh, then produces the sequences and also some related information like uh, quality scores. And they usually come out of the sequencing machine in FASTQ format. And here are just some some different uh, uh, examples on how the sequencing on the sequencing machine is actually done. But there are also other ways. But for example, in Illumina dye sequencing, uh, the library molecules are first clustered, so so copied many times on a flow cell, and then uh, then the sequencing is done by synthesis. So at the same time as they as uh, uh, as a strand is synthesized against the library molecule, uh, there is uh, always labeled nucleotide joining, joining the strand, and each time the uh, nucleotide has been incorporated, there is a sort of image taken of the clusters, and then uh, these um, labeled nucleotides send a fluorescent signal to this image and. Uh, and they take image each time nucleotide is incorporated and end up with, with the sequence. Then there is also, for example, this uh, fat bio single molecule real time sequencing that uh, binds the, uh, the molecule that is sequenced in this kind of a spore or well or how it's called. And, uh, and then the uh, on, this, on your a molecule that you are sequencing, there is the nucleotides are incorporated, and the machine reads <coughs> these small genetic changes caused by the nucleotide incorporation. Uh, then there is, uh, for example, nanopore sequencing, where the uh, sequenced strand passes through this kind of nanopore protein, and uh, the machine reads these small electrical current. Uh, Changes as the nucleotides pass through the pore. So there are different ways of ending up with the sequence of your molecule. And that kind of ends the sort of wet, wet laboratory part of sequencing, and then we enter into the computer world, so bioinformatics. So what comes out of the sequencing machine is raw reads and uh, you have to do something with them to be able to use them to see what you have in your sample. So normally you at least eliminate the low quality reads. So here is just as an example uh, how a quality score of a read might look. So this is a thread. Uh, Red uh, quality score. So all these nucleotides here have very high red 
uh, quality score, which means that they have very low probability of calling the base incorrectly. But then there is, in the beginning here, there is one base that's more likely to be wrong. So you might want to trim those, uh, those uh, uncertain nucleotides from your release. Then there is, of course, if you have been pooling your samples, you have to uh, demultiplex and divide the reads from different samples to separately. Then you have to, you have in your library preparation, you have added the adapters and indexes. Those have to be removed from the sequence. Then you, depending what you are doing, you might want to remove duplicate reads or background reads, for example, coming from the host. And uh, you might want to, if you have been doing uh, sequencing two ways, you might, might want to pair the reads. And then there might be some artifacts you want to remove from your reads that you actually use for, for your analysis. But yeah, after this uh, analysis of raw reads, you end up with the uh, sequences that you actually want to use for your analysis to see see what you have in your sample. So um, this is also, of course, uh, this identification of targets. It's also done done uh, via bioinformatics. So depending on the uh, on the size of the reads that you have, you might want to use your reads if they are long enough directly to, uh, to see what you have, so you can directly annotate your individual reads. But you might also end up with very small reads, so even just some 20 nucleotides or maybe 300 nucleotides or something like that. And you might want to somehow create longer context context from these uh, sort reads to be able to annotate your, your uh, targets properly. Um, and in amplicon sequencing, you might want to cluster your, your sequences before annotation. And uh, anyway, no, no matter what you, uh, what you do, the idea of this step is that you lead up with annotation of your sequences that you had in your sample. So maybe mostly it, it's taxonomic classification, but it can also be functional annotation and of course variant calling. And uh, here is just an example or sort illustration of this, where you use these uh, sort reads and uh, the computer programs uh, combine them as longer contexts and then you can compare to a sequence database that uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, existing sequences in the database these, these uh, your sequences correspond to. Um, then one very important step to be sure that you are finding what you want to find and that you don't find anything that you don't want to find is the analysis of controls. Yes. So uh, uh, in, the, in your samples you want to normally also include some controls that you can basically use to see that you don't have any contamination in your sample and that you actually find even the lower amounts of, of targets that you want to find and so on. And there are many applications in plant health. I think we will hear uh, some of them during this, this uh, morning. So I will not go too deeply into them, but here are just some examples. So for example, uh, it can be used for identification of pests causing novel diseases or surveillance programs uh, and so on. But we will hear more about them. Um, then uh, one thing I should mention, but what we also have a presentation is the reporting to the NPPO, which is also very important, especially when finding something that you don't expect. But we, I think we have a presentation on that. 
and also the works also that will be covered. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Joanna, for this introduction and uh, for your mm -hmm. hands today. I think we can um, we have time to take some questions from the from the audience. The only thing we ask you is to speak. Um, so we have a sound system which we've tried um, because we are recording. And um, when I tested it remotely, it was fine. Mm -hmm. The only thing is speak loud enough. Okay, so are there any questions for Joanna after this general presentation? Everything was very crystal clear. <laughs> that's often the pro not yeah. that's good with the introduction. You set the scene, and then uh, there, there will be some other talks that I'm sure will trigger questions. So if they are well, it may be one thing, but that's something you you will share. So you you're using it in your lab, um, as you explain in your bio, in the framework of research projects. So you're not yet using it in your diagnostic framework. No, not yet. But we would really like to use it. But um, yeah, uh, there are so many things that we would like to do that this is something that <laughs> that we have to postpone a little. But it will be used okay. in routine after some years, I'm sure. Okay, and are, is there any pressure from your National Plant Protection Organization to go for it? Mm, not right now. Some years ago there was, because they thought that this is the solution for everything. So just uh, <laughs> you can just grind all the samples that we have and put them on the machine and everything will be solved. But then we explained that there might also be some problems or something that we might want to solve before that. So. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joanna. 